Caitlin is a PhD student at George Mason University studying gender and gender nonconformity in early America. Her current research dives into the world of antebellum Tennessee, where the court recognized the legal name and gender of William Kramer. She hopes her research can contribute to the growing recognition of LGBTQ plus people in history. Today, she will be giving today's lecture, Fox Sibyls and Female Husbands, Gender Diversity in Early England. <laughs> All right, awesome. So hi everybody, thank you Claire for that awesome introduction. I'm so happy to be here today just to, I love being able to share the stories that I have, especially because there's kind of this conception that, you know, early America wasn't a place where gender diversity or gender nonconformity really happened. So actually being able to share these stories outside of my papers and dissertation prep and all that jazz is really awesome. So thank you again to London Town for this opportunity. So without further ado, <laughs> that made me feel magical. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, it is October 22nd, 1827. John Quincy Adams is currently president of the United States of America. Andrew Jackson is going to win the presidential election next year, but they don't know that yet. Travel by rail is picking up steam, and Missouri has recently become the 24th state to be admitted to the United States. Next door in Tennessee, a person is about to walk into a courtroom with an interesting petition. By the time the court adjourns for the day, the General Assembly of the state of Tennessee will enact the legal name change of one Susanna Kramer to the name William Kramer. They will rule that hereafter, William Kramer will be bound by all contracts, obligations, bills, bonds, and undertakings under that name, and shall hereafter possess and exercise all the rights and privileges held and enjoyed by free male citizens of the state of Tennessee. In other words, in 1827, the State Assembly of Tennessee will enact one of the earliest successful legal gender changes in the United States, which I personally think is <laughs> we don't know much about William Kramer. He was probably in his 20s when he made his way to Tennessee at the Tennessee courthouse. He had been considered a woman, worn feminine clothes, and gone by the feminine name of Susanna for upwards of 20 years. In 1825, however, he moved to Virginia dressed as a man and married a wife before returning with her to Greene County, Tennessee. We know that he lived, and we know that he went against the gender norms of his time period. He wasn't the first, nor, of course, was he the last. I've dedicated my research to uncovering stories like these. As a historian, I seek to expand, complicate, and diversify our understanding of gender in early America, specifically by looking at gender nonconforming individuals and their stories. According to conduct and etiquette books from the turn of the 18th century, early Anglo-American society was strictly divided between two genders, male and female. Based on sexual difference, these two categories were supposedly immutable and dictated how a person ought to dress and behave. Men wore waistcoats, breeches, coats, and tricorn hats. Women, on the other hand, wore petticoats, gowns, jackets, and caps. Oftentimes, our image of early America fits into these prescriptions. What I hope to do for you here today is highlight a few of the individuals who didn't, and convince you, hopefully, of gender nonconformity's deep historical roots. A quick side note before we get too much further. As you may notice throughout my presentation, I will not be using modern gender identities to refer to these individuals. The purpose of my research is not to point at any of these particular individuals and prove them to be specifically trans, non-binary, intersex, among any of our you know, numerous modern gender identities. They didn't have our present day vocabulary with which to express their gender. Even when they were breaking the rules, these individuals had to work within the gender framework that was available to them. Modern vocabulary was not among that. Instead, my goal was to show how even if that vocabulary wasn't there, the experiences were. So as much as I won't say something like, William Kramer was a trans man, right? I can't prove that he wouldn't have had that sort of terminology to talk, to him, talk about himself with. I will say that trans non-binary and intersex experiences like Kramer's, similar to Kramer's, have existed throughout history. 
As much as I avoid modern terminology, I have a couple of exceptions, of course, to prove the rule. Both assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth are widely used by the modern trans community and did not exist in the time of the 18th century, right? Assigned female at birth is someone who was perceived by society to be female, generally based on their anatomy, and thus is intended to follow feminine norms. On the other hand, an individual assigned male at birth is, by contrast, perceived to be male and intended to follow masculine norms. I use these terms for two reasons. First, they're just a lot more concise than anything else I can come up with, which is probably why the community uses them. And second, they don't take the individual's gender for granted. Just as I don't wish to you know, impose a queer gender identity on some of these people, I don't want to impose a binary gender either. Thus, referring to William Kramer as a sign female at birth allows us to quickly understand what gender society intended for them to express while also not encouraging us to assume that they were, in fact, a woman. I will also be frequently using singular they, them pronouns today. Unless I have a definitive action or statement from these individuals directly about their own gender, which unfortunately is few and far between to find, right, I will be using they, them pronouns. This is, again, to avoid imposing a gender identity on them, which is kind of a deeply personal thing, right? They avoids the implication that an individual's expression was correct when it matched with their assigned gender, for instance, right? And was wrong or deceptive when it didn't. It's also convenient when an individual's gender expression, as we will see in my presentation, was fluid over the course of their life. The number of times I've read things where it's like he, she, he slash she, like no, just they. It's easier. Before we talk about the people who broke the rules, let's talk a little bit about what the rules were. The rules, or gender norms, of early American dress and conduct were not the same as they are today. My favorite quick example of this is the color pink, right? Nowadays, we think of the color pink as feminine. We pink is girly, right? Blue, on the other hand, is the boy color. Boys wear blue, right? This wasn't always the case, and it wasn't the case in the 18th century. Pink and blue became gendered much later, which is actually a fascinating story that I will not go into today. <laughs> <laughs> Conduct and etiquette manuals set the rules for how men and women were supposed to act and covered everything from how to dress and move to how to speak and behave. Between 1620 and 1738, 44 different Conduct and Etiquette books were circulating in the Northern American colonies. Between 1738 and 1820, this number increased to 75. At the same time, literacy rates were on the rise. More and more people across all genders could read. Even those who didn't have the financial means to own books, which were still quite expensive at the time, could borrow them from public and private libraries. Readership of these etiquette manuals and the gendered behaviors and fashion sense they prescribed was increasingly spread, shared, debated, and critiqued. It's therefore unsurprising that our image of early America nowadays matches up with these prescriptions. Right? The society they described was the norm. And with so many books out there, it's unsurprising that these are the descriptions that have the best chances of surviving to historians today. By contrast with someone like William Kramer, <coughs> I have exactly two documents that even mention Manner of dress expressed to a public audience what one's gender was. Obviously, when we're talking about an entire century or two, as I am today, we can't talk about fashion as something monolithic and never changing, right? Fashion has certainly changed today from, say, the 1920s. A great deal. <laughs> but what I said earlier stands, right? Men wore waistcoats and breeches, and women wore petticoats and gowns. These were gendered clothes, much like how pants were considered masculine up until a certain point in our recent history, right? Other aspects of what presentation were also gendered. Men and women in the 18th century both had long hair, for the most part, right? That was the intended thing. But men predominantly wore it tied back, while women wore it generally styled and pinned up. Behavior was also part of these gendered conduct manuals. Men were expected to be witty, sharp-minded, possessing an affable demeanor and a straight posture. They were to give a conversation partner their full attention and dress neatly. Women, meanwhile, were instructed to focus on modesty, dignity, and virtue. They were to steer between the rocks of 
prudery and poetry, in dress and affect, to guard their virtue, lest they send the wrong messages to a man and attract unwanted sexual attention. How to stand, how to act, how to speak. Conduct works guided their readers in the art of becoming proper gentlemen and ladies. Despite appearances, the line between masculine and feminine was still a delicate one. For example, proper gentlemen were expected to be presentable, clean, and well-tailored. As the American colonies solidified into a republic, masculine fashion became more conservative in color and fabric, but men of a certain standing were still expected, you know, expected to dress in fine fabrics and colors. They were to take care of their appearance, but not too much, lest they be seen as too concerned with their appearance, a trait that was distinctly feminine. This was the predominant failing of the popular character of the fop. A satirical character meant to enforce gender norms <laughs> by chastising those who strayed from the path. The fop was known for his excesses. His clothes were too colorful, his accessories too impractical. He spent too much time on his physical appearance. He was effeminate in his vanity, and it was a sign of his empty head. An important note, however, because this is generally a common misconception, foppery was not necessarily tied to homosexuality. Sometimes foppery was interestingly even considered aggressively heterosexual. Sir Foppington, who is my personal favorite character ever in fiction, uh, because, yes, the character from a 1702 satirical work exhibited the failings of the fop to great hilarity and ridicule. His daily routine is an exaggerated ordeal, meant to drive home the point that he's as excessive as he is not properly masculine. Scented like a perfumer shop, and resembling a vessel with all of her rigging without ballast, Sir Foppington struts up and down the chamber, first turning one shoulder to the mirror, then to the other, <laughs> and then four right to the glass. <laughs> Obviously, an exaggeration, but there were real people out there Right, real men wearing colorful clothes, wearing maybe too much powder in their hair, right? So despite being meant to be a to constrain the meat binary, the character of the fob actually kind of presents us an interesting view into one of its fluidities. The boundary between masculine and feminine, obviously in an excess, in a sort of ridiculous or Foppington way, seems really clear, but it's kind of indistinct, right? At what point is fabric true colorful? At what point is, you know, too much time, too much time? How much time? There's no, like, distinct number. Like, if you spend 21 minutes, man, no. Right? <laughs> so the overblown characteristics of the fop were an exaggerated version of a reality that hosted a diversity of gender expressions. And cases of, of gender ambiguity and nonconformity generally fascinated people. Gender troubles and you don't need to read all of this. I will talk about all this text here. Gender troubles in the British American colonies started pretty much as soon as the colonists got here. Two centuries before William Kramer set foot in that Tennessee courthouse, in 1629, the General Court of Colonial Virginia presided over a very different case. Thomas Thomasine Hall had been brought before the court for dressing in women's clothing. Hall a servant recently employed by the planter John Atkins was the center of a controversy that would become one of the earliest legal cases of ambiguous sex in colonial America. Deputies of the court, both male and female, would go on to examine Hall's body multiple times in an attempt to fit Hall into one of two categories, man or woman. Scrutinized multiple times by different investigators, Hall's body would not provide the council an easy answer. In the end, they ruled Hall's biological sex ambiguous, ordering them to wear clothing representative of both genders. As recorded in the court's minutes, Hall was to wear men's apparel, only his head to be attired in a cloth and cross cloth with an apron before him, these last few items being feminine clothes. More interesting than the court's decision, however, his whole self-definition. At different times in their life prior to the court case, they presented as both a man and a woman. Assigned female at birth, they were raised as a girl 
named Thomasine. Later, they present him as a man, Thomas, to serve in the British military alongside their brother. After their service, Paul changed their gender expression once more, presenting as a woman and supporting themselves through the feminine career of making and selling lace. However, when they emigrated to the colonies as an indentured servant to Virginia, Paul presented again as a man. When asked during the trial, they defined themselves as both a man and a woman. Going back and forth between the gender binary, Paul went against the gender norms of their time, resulting in the legal case against them. What Hall's story <laughs> illuminates is that gender in early America didn't fall within the strict confines of the binary that the gender general court and society more generally would wish to enforce. But why was the general court taking such an interest in Hall's gender to begin with? Why did it matter? The concern of the cult of the court and Hall's community was not simply their gender ambiguity, but rather the rumor that Hall had slept with a female servant. In this regard, Hall's gender was of the utmost importance to determine if the alleged affair had been appropriate. Taken in this light, the decision of the court to dress them in a blend of both masculine and feminine attire was not so much an acceptance of Hall's gender ambiguity and fluidity Rather, this was most likely done to label Hall as another, with whom sexual and marital relations could never be proper. Which is sad. <laughs> Hall's existence, however, challenged the gender binary and forced the Virginian court to consider what lay beyond it, as stifled and restrictive as that view most likely was. Controlling sexual behavior played a large role in the concern of society had for gender and gender nonconformity. In cases of ambiguous gender, the court would try to determine, as they did with Hall, a binary sex and enforce it. Hall's body and gender presentation upset that system. A century later, across the pond, Mary Charles Hamilton would have mixed results, a different result, and not as fortunate. Since the age of 14, Mary Hamilton, no relation to the protagonist of a famous Broadway musical, <laughs> Sometimes. had dressed in men's clothing and lived as a man. Born in Somerset, England, Hamilton was assigned female at birth, but left home at 14 in their brother's clothes. They moved across England to Northumberland, where they apprenticed as a doctor, before returning to Somerset as Dr. Charles Hamilton. In 1746, they courted Mary Price, the niece of the woman from whom they rented lodging. In July, Charles and Mary were married, but three months later, Charles found himself in court. Mary Price had had her new husband arrested under the charge of fraudulent marriage. Hamilton appeared in court, still presenting as a man, reportedly very gay, with periwig, ruffles, and breeches. Their gender presentation, as Hulls had been, was insufficient evidence for the court, however. For the crime of fraud, Hamilton was sentenced to be publicly whipped and imprisoned for six months. Hamilton's trial was immortalized in the sensational and heavily fictionalized pamphlet, The Female Husband, and distributed across the British Empire. Though it had been their gender nonconformity that had been an issue, importantly, Hamilton didn't face punishment for dressing in men's clothing specifically. Their punishment was for marrying a woman and consummating the marriage thereby compromising their own sexual virtue, as well as the virtue of another woman. Sexual behavior, however, was not the only reason early American society was concerned with a clear-cut gender binary. Gender was also tied to the proper functioning of society. The collapse of gender roles in the writers of these gender etiquette manuals was the collapse of proper society, and even the weakening of the empire. Ten years after Hamilton's sensational trial, in 1757, author John Brown wrote, The sexes now have little apparent distinction, the one sex having advanced into boldness and the other sunk into effeminacy. Similarly, the Gentleman's Magazine bemoaned, A more unpleasant sight can scarcely be seen than that of a woman imitating the dress of a man. In this correspondence opinion, this was of worse consequence to the state. Society running smoothly, they thought, required that the people who make it up fall into their proper role. This became a graver concern as the British Empire actually began to be tested. The American Revolution and the many revolutions that followed it upturned many of the things that people had taken kind of for granted. 
What did it mean to be a British subject? After independence, what did it mean to be an American citizen? Or a French citoyen after the French Revolution? While people debated these questions in state halls, political clubs, and salons across the Atlantic world, discussions also turned to gender. What did it mean to be a man? What did it mean to be a woman? Or for that matter, an American man? Or an American woman? In this identity struggle, people were paying more attention to gender, and in turn, gender was being more explicitly and rigidly defined. As you might have caught on from my presentation thus far, however, gender would not exactly go quietly into those rigid categories. Probably my most modernly well-known person that I'll mention today is Deborah Sampson. Sampson is just one story in which the turmoil of the American Revolution provided an opportunity to defy gender norms, more so than it restrained them. Born in 1760 in Massachusetts and assigned female at birth, Deborah Sampson is most well known for dressing as a man to join the Continental Army in 1782 at the age of 22. Sampson used a number of male identities over the course of their life, and each represents a different moment of their non-conforming gender expression. In their first attempt to enlist, Sampson used the name Timothy Thayer, but Timothy never reported for duty. We don't know why. Sampson faced reprisals for the attempt, but not of the formal legal kind. The Third Baptist Church of Middleborough accused them of having dressed in men's clothing and attempted to enlist as a soldier, which was not, in their opinion, what a proper young lady should be doing. Samson was thus excommunicated from the church, but that didn't stop them. The next time they tried, they had more success. As Robert Shirtliff, Samson successfully joined the Continental Army and served as a light infantryman in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment. They would go on to serve for a year and a half, participate in multiple skirmishes, and be wounded at least twice. Their battle experience would include Carytown and New York. In 1783, Samson fell ill, not an uncommon experience for soldiers on either side of the conflict. Unfortunately for Samson, during their illness, their biological sex was discovered. Women were not permitted to be fighting in the army, and as an assigned female at birth individual, Samson was, by that same token, not supposed to be fighting either. They were honorably discharged and sent home. However, Samson did not immediately return to the female role they were assigned at birth. Following their service, Samson lived for a year in Massachusetts under the name Ephraim Samson, supposedly Deborah Samson's younger brother, and worked as a farmer. Only after meeting Benjamin Gannett Jr., whom they married the following year, would Samson return to a normative gender expression. Under each of their, ma their male names, Samson demonstrates how an assigned female at birth individual could express a masculine gender identity. The military provided solid employment and an outlet for patriotic zeal, but it also provided an opportunity for non-normative gender expression. Of course, not intentionally, but it did. Right? Uniforms concealed the body, and the military provided mobility and anonymity. The individual could leave the area they were known as their assigned gender, right, and start fresh with a new identity among strangers. This sort of mobility and fresh start might have been something that William Kramer was looking for in the civilian world when he moved to Virginia in 1825. Deborah Samson's time as a soldier was not unknown or hidden in the early days of the United States. In fact, Samson advertised it themselves after the war when trying to petition Congress to receive their military pension. In a series of presentations, Samson described their experience of the war to a public audience and even published a memoir. And yet, they had subverted gender norms, something that should have challenged the you know, delicate balance of society. Aside female at birth individuals who joined armies could be arrested, court martialed, or, you know, humiliated for the crime, right, of deceit or impersonation. What then made Samson's gender nonconformity acceptable? The idea of a man, of a woman in man's clothing, was scandalous, but it could possibly be redeemed. The difference in the outcomes between Kramer, Hamilton, and Samson, right, show us that. If an assigned female birth individual was ruled to be male, as was the case with Kramer, 
the premise of punishment disappeared. A man, after all, could not be punished for wearing men's clothing or performing a male role in society. However, if the assigned female at birth individual was ruled to be female, as with Hamilton and Samson, the next question was their virtue. As we've seen with Hamilton, sexual virtue played a large role. The key for Samson was the timing. Samson had been discovered after proving their worth in combat <coughs> and after the Continental Army had won their victory. <coughs> Additionally, in both Samson's tours and memoirs, Samson insisted on their feminine virtue and how patriotic zeal had compelled them to do what might be considered unthinkable. Instead of being interrogated for subverting gender norms, Samson was celebrated for their dedication and contribution to the Patriot cause. Samson therefore cast himself as one in a long line of women warriors, popularized in literature and celebrated as honorary men who served to validate the qualities seen as masculine. Despite what should have been rigid categories, gender was in some cases malleable allowing people to flaunt the rules and even get away with it, as it were, depending on the circumstances. It was easiest for early American society to make sense of a woman posing as a man. There were many reasons why an assigned female at birth individual might choose to present as a man, a great deal of which have very little to do with their gender identity. By dressing as men, they could have sought greater socioeconomic opportunities, security, privilege, independence, mobility, any number of things not as readily available to women. However, this gender inversion was still expressing a gender that defied the female norm. They were still acting in ways they shouldn't, and thus either faced punishment or acquired justification. A man posing as a woman, however, was taking an inferior position in the social hierarchy, and therefore was less comprehensible to society. This probably played a bit of a role in the gender scandal that spanned the Atlantic around a French noble by the name of the Chevalier d'Eon. Well, being a French noble, their name was actually much more complicated than that. Uh, it was Charles Geneviève Louis Auguste Henri Timothée d'Eon de Beaumont, but that is very long, so I will be referring to them as d'Eon and the Chevalier, uh, because you all don't want to listen to that every five minutes. <laughs> But in 1777, the Chevalier, or should I say the Chevalier, would become the talk of both the French and British empires. For the first 55 or 50 years of their life, the Chevalier Lyon was assigned male at birth, lived as a man, born in Burgundy, in East Central France, to a lower ranking noble family, Dion entered the French political scene in the court of Louis XV. The 1750s in Western Europe were a tumultuous time, and Dion found themselves caught right in the middle of it. Dion's <coughs> impressive political career began in secret, working as a spy for the Secret du Roi, for the King's secret, <coughs> Louis XV's personal secret body of spies that worked independently of the French foreign ministry. As a spy, Dion was dispatched to Russia in order to strengthen the relationship between the French king and the Russian empress, Elizabeth. An alliance between these two empires and that of Habsburg, Austria, would become invaluable when war erupted in 1756. Don't blame her. No! Spoilers! <laughs> when the government offered Empress Elizabeth military subsidies, Dion was part of her court, facilitating the two rulers' secret correspondence and influencing Russian nobles with their charms, and reportedly over 3,000 livres of French wine that they had sent with them to over the course of their stay in Russia. As the Seven Years' War, the European side of what we call the usually America's the French and Indian War drew on, Dion would eventually return to France, their secret mission of success, securing the alliance between Russia and France, and they would serve as a dragoon captain in the French military. For their service, both military and diplomatic, Dion, at the young age of 35, was awarded the rare medal, the Cross of Saint-Louis. This prestigious medal was awarded to noble military officers for acts of unusual heroism and bravery in war. Thus, Dion received the rank of Chevalier, or Knight. The war was less rewarding for France itself. 
In the peace treaty with Britain in 1763, France lost its colonial holdings in the North American continent. Canada went to Britain, while Louisiana went to Spain. But what does all of this have to do with gender? There's no In 1770, a peculiar rumor began to circulate about the Chevalier Dion, currently living in London and working under spa as a spy under the cover of political exile from France. Word had it that the Chevalier Dion was actually a woman. We don't know where the rumor started or why, but once it began, it quickly grew. Londoners were fascinated by this. They started betting on what Dion's true sex was. Thousands of pounds were wagered one way or the other, and many attempted to even offer Dion money to, for proof. It got so out of hand that the wagers even made their way to court, setting a precedent in British and American contract law. It was ruled that such wagers about a third priority were in doubt because they required indecent evidence to be settled, which might harm the reputation of said third party. Interesting, this case actually set precedence for libel trials against President Jefferson many years later, so it continued to be relatively important, all because people were obsessed with figuring out what this person's gender was supposed to be. In 1777, the Chevalier would step forward to take the matter into their own hands and resolve the matter herself. Give me the next picture. No. Oh, there we go. Dressing in women's clothing, Dale declared herself to be a woman and would go on to live the rest of their life, the next 33 years, as a woman. Rewriting the story of her life thus far, Dion announced that she had in fact been born assigned female at birth, but it had been kept a secret so that her parents could raise her as a boy. Thus, she had kept her sex a secret in order to have a political and military career. In her own words, she retold the story of her time as a spy in Russia. Not only was Dion at the Russian court as a male ambassadorial secretary, she also infiltrated as a female tutor and confidant of Empress Elizabeth herself. She left France, as she put it, with two trunks, one of men's clothing and the other of women's clothing. Due to her secret, she was perfectly positioned to play the role. There is little to corroborate Dion's story about her time in Russia, but even at the time, it was a very popular version. What we do know is that from 1777 onwards, she lived as a woman, still proudly bearing her military award for bravery in the army. Retaining her title of chevalier, she participated in fencing matches against men. People continued to be fascinated by her gender, but as with Kramer found to be male, right, if Daniel was in fact assigned female at birth, there was nothing odd about her dressing in women's clothing. Rather, it was her time presenting as a man that made her exceptional during her time period. Gender non-conformity could be tolerated, even celebrated, as with Samson and Dion. And it was, in the case of the highly public figure of the Chevalier, a matter of fascination and gossip. The fascination did not stop, even at Dion's death. In May 1810, Dion passed away at the age of 82. The newspaper obituary, which got her name wrong, or her age wrong, interestingly, read, On Tuesday died in the 69th year of his age, the Chevalier Dion, memorable as a political character and chargé des affaires from the court of France, but more so on the account of the questionable gender to which this extraordinary character naturally appertained. It will be in the recollection of many that about 36 years ago, policies, that is to say, bets or wagers, were open to ascertain the sex of this extraordinary nondescript to the amount of 200,000 pounds, which were eventually decided and paid upon a surgical certificate after personal examination that the reputed chevalier was a female. The French physician, Peride, however, who attended the chevalier in his last moments and examined the body of its dissolution, now positively declares that in reality it proved to be the body of a male. 
Just as Hull's body had been examined two centuries prior, the Chevalier was examined after her death. Though that seemed to close the matter for her contemporaries, it hardly tarnishes the way she defined the gender roles of her time. Her body did not define her, and as such, she expressed her gender the way she saw fit. Fifteen years later, William Kramer would do something similar when he moved from Tennessee to Virginia. Maybe he had heard of the Chevalier. Her story had made its way across the Atlantic, her memoirs sold in shops in Philadelphia, and her story inspiring multiple works and characters and plays. It's entirely likely that he hadn't. We'll never know. Either way, Kramer followed in a long line of people who, for whatever their reasons, expressed their genders in a way that defined, defied the norms of their period. Gender was hardly as immutable and unchanging as early American society would like to have claimed. And stories of gender nonconformity were fascinating, more so than horrifying, to the general public. Or at least, you know, people who bet thousands of pounds probably thought so. Hopefully, by sharing some of their stories with you here today, I've shown you all that gender and gender expression in early America and the early Atlantic world was much more diverse than we might otherwise give it credit for. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.